it's good to be here today. Something I want you to do for me today and for yourself. Actually, it's more for yourself than it is for me. I want today for you to say, God, whatever you want to speak to me, not for my neighbor, not for the person across the street, not for somebody in another church, not for somebody else in another state, not for another political party, but God, what you want to speak to me is what I want to hear today. Because we have a self-awareness problem as human beings, right? We're constantly projecting, blaming everybody else, and God wants to start with you, and he has a word for you today. He has a word for me. Just because I'm holding a mic and speaking, I mean, he may, I may get saved at the end of this message. I don't know what's going to happen. But I want you to be open to what God has to say to you because culturally in this country, we have some very troubling things happening. And we like to project and blame, and it's this party, and it's that party, and it's that group. It's a sin problem. We like to say it's a skin problem. It's a sin problem. Sin is wrecking this nation. And God said, if my people called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn. There's the remedy. Not if we get a different political party in. Not if this happens, not if we shut down this hate group. If my people called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will what? Hear, then I will forgive, then I will heal their land. It starts with us. It starts with you. And I know I'm coming right out of the gate preaching today. But I have such a passion this morning for people that have been coming in week after week or getting up day after day and you're walking through the desert. Lap after lap after lap after lap when God's got a promised land waiting for you. But you keep doing the same old thing, expecting a different result, but you don't get a different result. Aren't you tired of the insanity? Aren't you tired of waking up every day and having the news shove some bad, awful thing down your throat? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We are people that set apart and we have the remedy for what's going on in our culture. And I'm going to show you the remedy today for you and me. Because this is where it begins. Right here. We can complain about Metropolis. The remedy is right here. You can complain about your spouse. The remedy is right there inside of you. Jesus changes from the inside out. We try to get him to change from the outside in. Oh, if the circumstances surrounding me were better, I'd have a better day. No, it starts with your heart. And I know some of you are hurting and you're struggling. And you wish some external circumstances would change. I know. I've been there. I am there. I live there. I wake up every day in a house that smells like a fox on 12th Street next to what they call the ghetto BP. I have people ride their bikes and push their carts and make loud noises at 3 in the morning. That's okay. I bought a chihuahua. I'm protected now on 12th Street. I'm good to go. I know. I, I live that. I've been through some stuff. Anybody else been through some stuff? This is not a day you can pretend. We don't live in pretense here. At all. I grew up in a church environment that liked to pretend that everything, they had everything all together. We're not those people. Until we get honest that we don't have everything all together, we're not going to get anything together. Come on. Preach it, Pastor Ryan. I think I'm going to do that today, all right? And you can preach with me, okay? I believe today that life change can happen. I believe it can happen right in this moment. This moment. So let's pray and let's ask God to move today. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together for such a time as this. It's no accident that who's gathered here today is here. Lord, you drew them. They thought that they were coming just to visit. God, they thought they were coming just to do their religious duty. But no, God, you got them here because you have a word for us. And Jesus, you said, he who has ears, let him hear. And so, Father, we want to have the ears to hear what you say. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 1 is where we're going to be today, starting in verse 40. Just a couple of verses. 
I don't have a whole lot, which is usually a way a preacher lies of saying, I'm going to let you out early. I don't know what's going to happen. Let's just go with the flow. But Jesus, Jesus is beginning his ministry, and, and it says, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging. Everybody say begging. Everybody say begging. Begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me. And you can make me clean. Notice that. If you, Jesus, are willing, you can heal me. And you can make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion. I, did, I looked up the Greek word for that phrase, moved with compassion. And in our day and time, the seed of the emotions is the heart. I love you with all my heart. Don't tell my heart, my achy breaky. <laughs> I just don't think it'll understand. But in Jesus' days, it says that it was a yearning. The seat of the emotions was the bowels back in Jesus' day. And I just thought that would, that would make our love songs a little bit more interesting, wouldn't it? Don't tell my bowels. My, that's probably a medical problem. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Now, I don't know if God's going to do some healing in phases for you today, or I don't know if, or I don't know if it's going to happen in a moment, but I'm going to pray like it's going to happen here and now. And I'm not talking about just physical diseases, the things that are going on with you emotionally. We have a Savior that by one touch from Him, He can make all things new. One. And sometimes as ministers, we get scared to pray like that because if somebody don't get healed in that moment, we're like, oh gosh, something's wrong with us. God's not listening to me. No, have some faith today that he is the one that can make you clean. He is the one that can heal you. It's not enough just to be healed. You need a cleansing as well. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I'm going to just title this talk, Beggars Can Be Choosers. Beggars can be choosers. It wasn't like when I was in junior high and couldn't get a date. Beggars can't be choosers then. You know, you just take whoever will go with you. Beggars can be choosers. Now, I'm going to tell you something about me. Um, I have something in life that I don't like. I have a few things in life that I don't like. But I have something that uh, probably would save me money if I would learn to like it more. I don't like leftovers at all. Food. That's what I'm talking about. I don't like leftovers. Chili is not better. There are, there are toxic bacteria growing in that chili, and that's probably why my body's hurting at 36. Because my parents, they had three kids uh, that they, they raised, and, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. Dad decided instead of going off and being a CEO or something, he's like, I'm going to preach the gospel so we can be poor forever. And then my mom would make something called, my mom would make something called, maybe you've heard of this before. Anybody ever ate goulash? Goulash is pretty much where it's got some meat, some corn, some continental tires. It's got a little bit of everything inside of that goulash. But we would eat that goulash all week long. And I can remember being traumatized as a kid, opening up the refrigerator and seeing that goulash that was cold and stuck together. There was hair growing on it. There was foreign objects. I mean, there were people coming to colonize it. It was disgusting. I don't like leftover. I get grossed out by it. It's bad because I'll make something and it'll be good the next day. Now you can do pizza the next day, right? Anybody like cold pizza? You can, you get pizza out of the refrigerator, eat it for breakfast, whatever. But most of the time with me, I'm not making a bowl, a pot of chili and going to get it out like three days later and pour some water in it and eat it again. I just can't do it. And this folks is why I am poor. Because I don't use my resources wisely. And every time I go out to eat, because I'm a lot smaller than I used to be, I can't eat the big boy meal anymore. But I'll order too much, and they'll come around, and they'll ask if you want a what? Do you want a to-go box or styrofoam deal or a doggy bag? And I always say, yes, because I know that I'll eat this later. But here's what happens to my leftovers every time I get a to-go bag. It sits in the refrigerator. 
And, it's, and listen, I'm a bachelor too, so my refrigerator is disgusting. There are stuff from Nano's kitchen that's been there for months. You'd be surprised. There's probably the cure for cancer or something inside that burrito that's been sitting there for about six or eight months. But that's what, that's what it looks like. I forget about them. That's what we do. We forget about leftovers. And, and, and when I was listening to Pastor Babu a couple of weeks ago, he was amazing, by the way, when he came in. He, he does a lot of ministry in leprosy colony, leper colonies, and a lot of ministry to lepers. And then dads went to India before, and, and he's done ministry to lepers and seeing them come to know Jesus. And Pastor Babu was talking about how he's been able to get in the water and baptize lepers. And he made a statement that stuck with me for weeks, and I've been thinking about this. He said, lepers are leftovers. They're leftovers. We probably don't even think about leprosy all that much. You probably didn't wake up today thinking about leprosy. It's a debilitating disease, and people do get it, especially at other parts of the world. But he said in, in, in our country, they're, they're, they're leftovers. People forget about them. They're left out. They're quarantined. And you know what? I thought it's not just a leper that feels like a leftover culturally. It's not just a leper that feels left out. There are people sitting in this room today that feel like a leftover, that feel forgotten about, that feel left out. You've got something going on or you've been through something and you think there's no use for me. They just put me in my little quarantined area and they forget about me and they just stay away from me. But then he said something that resonated with me and I want to speak this word to you. God loves leftovers. God, he said, do you want to believe me? When the little boy had the Captain D's lunch that he gave to Jesus and Jesus multiplied it and he feed the 5,000 people, what happened? There were leftovers. Jesus didn't say, just leave the leftovers, we'll give it to the birds. He said, no, get them up and put them in a basket, we'll take them with me. A word for you today, God loves leftovers. People may have no use for you, but God will pack you up and take you on a journey with him. God loves those who are left out, marginalized, outcast, been through some stuff, had some failures. That's who God uses it. Even when he called his disciples, he didn't call the elite, he called a foul-mouthed fisherman. He called a tax collector who everybody hated, and he used them to begin to change the world. God loves those who are left out, marginalized, pushed out, overlooked, been through some junk. He loves leftovers, the ones that nobody is thinking about. When they were looking for a king and Samuel went to the house of Jesse and they had seven boys stand up, these must be the king. And Samuel's like, Jesse, don't you have another boy? He's like, yeah, he didn't even name the boy. He's like, I got a young one out there in the sheepfold. And Samuel's like, that's who God's going to make king. You know what? God selects what man rejects. God loves leftovers. And for those of you that feel like you've been through some stuff, you feel like you're used goods, you feel like you've got a repulsive sin problem, you feel like you, you, you're, you're not going to make anything of your life, you feel like, like you're not somebody else that doesn't make you anything, God loves you exactly where you are. That's who God uses. And if you're elite in the room, if you're popular, God still loves you too. The only deal that we have with people who have that mentality is they don't think they need God. God uses people who know they need him. Just like this leper in this story, God loves those of us that have been left out and left over and been through some stuff. You think your sin has disqualified you? You think your mistake has disqualified you? Let it get into the presence of God and watch him take what was meant for evil and use it for good. God loves leftovers. No matter where you are today, no matter what you're going through, and by the looks of it, I know there's probably nobody in the room that's suffering with leprosy. But it, you might be suffering with some other kind of anxious problem or you might have been abused when you were young and you feel like you're no good, you're left out, that's it, this is what my life is going to be. Encounter Jesus today. God loves you. That's maybe the word for somebody in the room today. 
The whole reason why I'm preaching is to let you know and to remind you that God loves you. Well, I got around God's people and I didn't feel the love. Well, that's a bad example of what God's love is like. They may not even have God inside their life anyway if they didn't express and show his love. God loves you no matter where you've been, what you've done, who you are, who your family was, what you've been through, mistakes you've made, whether you fit in or you didn't. God loves you. So for the leftover today, you're not a leftover. You are created in the image of God and loved by him. And you have a purpose. You have a purpose that he created you for because the creator doesn't create by accident. We just get in these modes and and areas in our life where we feel like life is just meaningless and pointless. But if we recognize that the creator loves us right where we are, he has a purpose for us. God uses people like that. Look throughout the scripture. We, would, we look at the, at the people in the Bible as biblical heroes. They're not. They're jokers. <laughs> They're messed up people. They made mistakes. Abraham lied. I mean, let's not even get into Jacob. Peter denied Jesus. You know, I mean, all of these people had mistakes, and God used them. So today, I didn't grow up in that family, so they're, they're better than me. Or, gosh, this guy preaches. He must be... I, I hate it. I don't know why I ever got into preaching because all I have to hear in my entire life, and you're a preacher and you do that. That's how they say it too, like appalled. Now, I'm not saying I'm out like kicking babies across the street or anything because if I was doing that, they need to go, and you're a preacher and you're doing that. But they look at people that do ministry. This is just my calling. This is where God has placed me. I didn't ask for it. I grew up a pastor's kid. I didn't want it. But I had to accept it because this is a grace that he's given me to do my gift. But this doesn't make me better than anybody else in this room. No matter where you're from, what you've been through, what you struggle with, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You know why? Because we all sin... And fall short of the glory of God. All sin. Everyone sins. Everyone. Billy Graham, he sinned. I mean, we didn't have to read about it, but he messed up. Everyone sins and falls short of the glory of God. And when you look at leprosy in the Bible... It gives a picture of what sin does to us, where leprosy was something that was physical. Sin is something that is spiritual, but it hurts us spiritually the way that the the disease would hurt, hurt the leper physically. It was an inward disease. See, leprosy could be seen on the outside, but it wouldn't manifest itself for a while because there was a problem that lied beneath the surface. And it's just like that with sin. The thing that we're afforded with in our culture now is we can pretend like we don't have problems. Where the leper, you could see their problem. A lot of us can walk around and look good in our white button-up shirt, take that perfect angled selfie, filter it just right, use our kids as social media ornaments, look at how great my life is. Even some churches take pictures of how awesome their services look, but when you go, it's dead. It's dead on the inside because the problem lies with in. And what leprosy would do is it would start on the inside, then it would, then it would affect the outside, and sin will eventually do that. Sin affects us on the inside, and then it will affect us on the outside because you, what you do eventually will be found out. But we have so many people that live in pretense that try to pretend like something's not wrong, and they try to stuff it and hide it and play the part, but they're hypocritical, and eventually it comes out. Now, listen to me. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Leprosy could not be hidden. It was separating. They had to be quarantined, pushed out, 
outside, in the Old Testament, they had to stay outside the camp because their disease was unclean. And if anybody touched a leper, it would make that person unclean. And they would have to go through this cleansing ritual to make themselves clean again. Leprosy would separate, just like sin separates us from God. I know, we're not supposed to talk about sin in 2019. Well, that's the problem. We're not talking enough about sin in 2019 because sin is serious. Sin was serious enough to send Jesus to the cross. Sin is a problem. Sin is the source of all of our problems. The human human heart is wicked. Sin is a problem and it separates us from God. Sin separates friends and families. It affects your friends. It affects your families. Listen, when the leper would touch somebody, it would make them unclean. I'm speaking to a father in the room. If you don't deal with what's going on in your heart, it's going to affect your family. It can affect your kids. If you don't get that substance abuse problem dealt with now, you can pass that on to your children. The curse is real. I, I, I pray about this every day. God, let me pass on a blessing to my children. And I've been through some stuff where I didn't have, always have the right mentality, the right attitude, the right approach to life. And I was very dangerous of, of my kids seeing how I was acting, and they would act out the same way. See, some of you know what that's like. You grew up with a dad that was angry, and you don't know why you can't control your anger. Because sin affects those around us. It separates friends. Some people haven't talked to other people for so long because of a sin. They got mad at one another, whether it was envy or jealousy. Churches even do that. They get bitterness that's rooted inside of us, and it separates us. That's what sin does, just like leprosy, mother, father, child, whoever's in the room, if you don't get this dealt with, you're going to affect not only your life, but those around you. And it's time today for a remedy for our problem. The leper couldn't cure themselves. There was no natural remedy during biblical times. They couldn't do it. We see sometimes throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament where God healed a leper, but they couldn't do anything themselves. They couldn't cure themselves. Can I tell you something about your sin problem? You can't fix it on your own. You can. Well, I go to church. <laughs> okay. We're glad you're here. You need community. Awesome. But that's not going to cure your problem. Well, I listen to K-Love. Awesome. I know the worship. I lift my hands during worship. I hope you wore deodorant. Great. It's fantastic. It's not going to fit. We try to do these muster up enough, you know, self willpower to try to fix our. We can't fix ourselves. We can't fix our sin. Jesus even said one time that, that many will stand before me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And he's going to say, Depart from me, I never knew you. And see, that's what I've been thinking about the past couple of days is how many people have cycled into the seats of the church and they think they're doing God a service and they think that that's their ticket to spend their eternity with him. It doesn't work like that. You can't fix it that way. Oh, I'll just be a good person. Define what good is. I mean, good might be what's relative to you. You can't keep the law. Can't do it. It's impossible. You can't cure yourself. And I don't want to see one day people stand before God and say, God, I went to church. God, I preached on the stage. God, I played the drums. God, I taught the kids. And, they, and, and God say, I don't know who you are. That will not fix your problem. Now, because I'm in Christ Jesus, I can go forth with the works that he's put in front of me. It makes it better. When you know Jesus, church is a whole lot better. When you know Jesus, worship's a whole lot better. When you know Jesus, being around your family is a whole lot better. But works will not cut it. The wages of sin is death. No one is saved by what they do because it can't fix the problem. So we're all on level ground, every one of us, whether you have a lot or you have nothing, level ground. Whether you look like Ryan Gosling or you look like Steve Buscemi, level ground. The millennials got that joke, good. No matter what, whether you had a good job or you, you know, had a job that wouldn't be considered great, it's level 
We're level ground today, okay? We need to know that. We're on level ground so no one can look down on anyone else if they have to respond today, right? We have a culture that looks down on one another. I mean, just look at social media. This is what I don't get. Like growing up, I was constantly, and this, this is just a little sidebar here. I was constantly told growing up of how the church was just trying to beat people over the head with the Bible and force them to believe the way that they believe. Of course, I never grew up around anybody like that. I grew up around people that loved people right where they were, and I seen people come off of drugs after they'd been on, like, meth for 13 years, and I seen marriages restored, and I seen God do some miraculous works. But that's all we ever heard from the culture is they're just trying to force the way they believe down our, down our throats. They're Bible beaters. Do y'all read social media? If you don't believe like the culture, they cast you out. They try to force their beliefs down your throat. And then when you don't believe like they believe, they start giving you labels and calling you names and saying they're going to boycott your businesses. The culture's a bunch of hypocrites. They're the ones with the problem because they're trying to find the remedy outside of the real person that can rescue them. It's level ground. Now, before you go, okay, well, I'm better than somebody in the culture. Mm -mm. You're not. You may not do things as bad. But there's none righteous, no, not one. Everybody in their heart has a longing for something more. They have a longing. You can see that. They have a longing to belong. They have a longing for fulfillment. They have a longing. Maybe you're in this room today and you have a longing for some things to change in your life. And you're not doing anything about it because you don't know what to do. Well, today is the day where we're going to just give you a couple of solutions on what you can do to either begin the process of healing or watch God do a miraculous work right now. And can I say something to the people in the room that may have been going to church for the long time? and you've never got it right with Jesus, I know you might be embarrassed. And I know that might be what's keeping you from responding to the gospel because you're embarrassed because you've told your grandkids and your friends and you've done work in the church for a long time. And it'd be embarrassing if that happened. Let me tell you what would happen at this church. What would happen if somebody gave their life to Jesus this morning? How would we respond? I said this last night, my 80-something-year-old grandfather, been in church for 70 years, didn't have it right. A little over a year ago, we baptized him because he gave his life to Jesus. <laughs> 70 years looking for a solution, going to church, hearing his son preach, was proud of him. Sang up here when he got to sing bass like J.D. Sumner and the Stamps. It was crazy. But finally got it right. And I, he's nearing the end of his life. He doesn't feel good all the time, but he knows where he's going. He's got something greater on the other side. <laughs> Don't sit in this room today and go, no, I can't do it. What would they think? If somebody thinks something, they've got the sin problem. They're self-righteous. And you know what? We don't want you to have that attitude around here. And I say this, too, for those of you that are struggling. I just got to preface it. I know you're concerned. I'm not telling you you have to get up here because the leper would have to cry out. Does anybody know what they'd have to cry out when somebody would pass by? Unclean. They'd have to let everybody around them know, I'm unclean. Now imagine if that was what church was like now. You know, Jacob comes in, liar! I'm a liar! Just so everybody knows, I'm a liar. I tore the tag off the mattress. I'm dishonest. I'm a liar. You don't have to get up in front of everybody and go, yeah, I, I struggle with this, but today you can bring it in the presence of God, and you're going to have people here ready to minister with you. It's confession, not concealing, that leads to healing. And keeping that stuff away is going to keep you dealing with it for a long time. Simple message, but we need it. 
I've been thinking. We do a lot of principles in the church, and I love it. We need to teach you how to do your finances, and we need to teach you to ha- how to have good relationships. But maybe the issue with the church and the reason why it doesn't have a lot of power is there's not a lot of people that possess the power. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Well, why are these weapons prospering against us? We've been given dunamis power, the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can take authority over things, but we're little timid people because maybe we don't possess it because we're dealing with our stuff and we've never surrendered it over to God. I'm ready to see some change. I don't want to think that our best days are behind us. Like even when the early church was persecuted and it had its backs against the wall and they told them to shut up, you know what they did? They didn't run away and go, I don't know how we're going to deal with this. I feel triggered. Oh my gosh, I need to go blog about it on social media. No, they got together and prayed and they said, God, give us boldness. Hear their threats. Let us keep going out and making a difference. I want to see a church, the big C, not just Eastland, a church, remember who they are, get some things right here at home and go out there and affect a culture culture because we all have a longing a longing in our heart and our country has a problem every one of us are aware of all the things that are going on and we're begging at the foot of a political party to make things right that's dangerous you know that's what they thought Jesus was going to do they thought he was going to Take care of Rome and establish an earthly kingdom. I'm not saying we can't live through times of peace, and I'm not telling you not to have your voice heard. Get involved. It's your right, but that's not the solution. What goes on in the White House is not the solution. Jesus sits on the throne. He's the solution. But every one of us have this longing inside. The Bible says a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, a man with leprosy, and your issue may not be leprosy. And when I was reading this, I just was thinking about the people that would walk into the room, you know, a woman with cancer came in, a man with an anger problem came, a teenager with a substance abuse problem came. A woman who went through a divorce came in today. See, we're on level ground. A millennial struggling with anxiety came. Whatever it may be. It may not be leprosy, but it's tearing you up. And what leprosy would do to the limbs of the people that had the disease is they would get numb. They wouldn't notice that parts of their body were falling off. And that's what our problems do to us. They numb us. A man who sinned and has been trying to hide that sin came. A woman who's been giving her, her body away came in today. And maybe you're numb and hurting. Maybe you're numb to the point you're like, there's nothing that anybody can do for me. I think if we'd be honest... All of us have been there. All of us have been through some stuff where it's completely numbed us. Where we've cried out to God and we've prayed about it and we asked God to give us what we thought should be the answer to our prayer and he didn't do it. And then we've gotten completely numb. And what's interesting about people that are numb is I see them come back to church over and over and over and over. But nothing ever changes because you're numb. When they sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain, you just think, okay, when's this going to be over with? I clocked in. Then eventually you disappear and you leave. And you start begging at all the wrong places. A man with leprosy came in and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. This man was motivated because he couldn't heal himself. He couldn't fix it on his own. There was nothing to be done. He was was marginalized and he was pushed out and nobody wanted to touch him and nobody wanted to be around him. So what he was doing right here in this moment was risky anyway. 
because he could have touched somebody and made them unclean. But he came and knelt in front of the one that could actually fix his problem. But I find that my reaction when I'm struggling is I go begging in all the wrong places. Oh, it may give me a little bit of satisfaction, but it eventually goes away. That's what we do. I got an anger problem, maybe if I distract myself. I got an anger problem, maybe, maybe if I just, I take this pill or I ingest this substance, this will make me feel better. We start begging at all the wrong places. You see this with teenagers too, because they're constantly comparing each other's lives on social media. Well, if I don't have a boyfriend, then I'm nobody. And you go begging and begging and begging for this connection. It's a God-given need, but you go begging in the wrong places for it. And then when that doesn't work out, it leaves you empty and hurt. You see what we do? When things go wrong, we go begging in the wrong spots. But this leper recognized that there was somebody who could do something about this. And I'm here to announce today, whatever you're going through, whatever hurt you've been through, whatever sin you've committed, you are in a place with someone who can do something about it. But you have to stop kneeling and begging in all the wrong places. It's not going to help. Going home and turning your TV on, begging in front of your TV to distract yourself and not dealing with that family problem is not going to make it go away. It's going to enhance it. And what happens too when we're feeling lonely and we're hurt and we've messed up and we've sinned? or we've been through some stuff, or we've been abused, we go find ways to just try to feel better, to make ourselves feel. We go beg for this thing to make me feel, make me better. And it lasts for a moment. But the problem when we go and beg in places like that is they become addictions. And then we got a whole nother problem on top of our problem because we're begging in the wrong places. This man knew I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us whether he had heard about Jesus and heard what he could do, but he knew I had to get to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. You can make me clean. We don't have to even talk about sin, anxiety, struggles that you've been through. Maybe you're just struggling with some kind of pain, some physical pain. We do have a healer, and I'm going to pray like God will do it right now. I don't know if he will. If he doesn't do it today, you know what we'll do tomorrow? We'll pray like he'll do it tomorrow. You know what we'll do the next day if it doesn't happen? We're going to keep praying. Eventually, God will give us an answer on what he's going to do. But we're begging in the wrong places. This is why I said beggars can be choosers. You have a choice today on what you're going to kneel in front of of what you're going to reach out to. Are you going to come to church today and come in, sing some songs, hear a message, and go back home and kneel in front of that thing that's not really doing anything for you? And then do it again the next week. And then ask yourself questions of like, I don't know why God's not doing anything in my life. I don't know why this is not going away. I don't know why I'm not, I don't know why I don't have any hope. I don't know why we can't get our marriage to work. I don't know why, I don't know why, I don't know why. It's because you're going to the wrong places. This man gives us an example of what we're supposed to do today. Because I know you have a longing in your heart for some things to change. I know you do. I know you want to feel better. I know you feel outcast. I know there's some of you in the room that was taken advantage of at a young age and you felt like you're no good your entire life and the enemies brought some temptation along and you've been begging for that to give you some peace and give you some fulfillment and it's just become an addiction. But that can stop today. I know the longing that's in there. You know how I know? I've been there. Longing for God to do something. I can't fix this. God, do something I worried about. And I'm just going to be transparent. I worried about with what I went through on how I was going to be able to raise my children. I'm a good dad. 
I'm going to go ahead and tell you that. Beck gave me a plaque that said, best daddy ever. I'm the best daddy ever. You got it? <laughs> but I worried because what they were experiencing was a curse. It's a curse. It's evil. It was sin. And they are so young that it's confusing to them. I'm like, man, I'm going to have to spend my entire life trying to fight this curse. And Blake sent me a text message one day. He said, Ryan, you got to remember this. The blessing is always more powerful than the curse. So I recognized that my job was to pass the blessing on. And when I have my children and they're laying in bed, I put my hands on them and I pray over them. God, protect them. God, fulfill every purpose you have for them. God, bless them. Father, may they come to know you. And I got to put it in his hands and trust him. And it takes away some of the anxiety I have as a father. But I know what it's like to long. And sometimes the things you're longing for is not the things that God's going to give you. Maybe he doesn't want to heal you. We do need to talk about that real quick. Because that's possible. But his grace will be sufficient for you. He'll put you in community that will walk with you. God doesn't always answer the prayers the way we think he should. He doesn't always give me what I want. But he's faithful to supply what I need. But what is your longing today?